Okay, we're going methodically through the scripture. Last week was a bit of an overview, and this week we're going to start with the Sabbath at creation. And guess what we're going to do next week, too? The Sabbath at creation. It's going to be great. Uh, and we're just, we're just going through the Bible. So it's going to take how, as long as it takes. That's fine. Because, you know, you've got to mix things up a little bit. Sometimes you do a kind of uh, in, in, encouraging message. You want people to know they can get through COVID, all that kind of stuff. And sometimes you just do theology. And you're like, we're going to dive deep into this thing. And we're not going to be doing it all in Greek and Hebrew. We have a pastor who pastors in Springfield and in Bloomington Normal. And he preaches out of a Bible. Half of it is Hebrew and half of it is Greek. And that's how he preaches. And I'm not on his level, so we're not going to be doing that. But, but... We're going to be going deep into the Word, and that's okay to do too. So sometimes you fly over, you swim at the surface and splash and have fun, and sometimes you, you just dive. And, uh, and that's what we're going to be doing during this particular series. All right. We uh, I want to thank Laura, who's no longer behind me, I guess. Uh, beautiful special music. And uh, I, I love that. We first heard that song, well, not the song, but that arrangement of the song, around Easter when Hillsong released this five-track uh, EP, I guess. And, oh, man, it was, just, it was just beautiful, and it still is. And I appreciate you sharing that with us. And, of course, my daughter, who wants to be on the stage and scream and all those kind of things. You know, what are you going to do, man? I've always heard pastors' kids were trouble. I just didn't realize they started at two. I always thought it was something that would come later. Um, you know, I've done a really good job of not being one of those pastors who, you know, every sermon illustration is about their kids or their wife or whatever. I don't want to be that kind of pastor. And yet, you got to uphold your end of the deal too there, Arwen. Okay, I'm not telling stories about you. You, you don't act out as the pastor's kid, okay? This is, a, this is an arrangement we have here. We signed a contract. I mean, I signed it for you, obviously, but you were there in the room. All right, I'm just kidding. All right. So uh, back to the Sabbath, we are, uh, we're, we're, my, what, what is the goal here? I want you to understand the Sabbath better, the theology of the Sabbath, what its purpose is in the Bible. And I want to speak to the Adventists for a second because sometimes for Adventists who are so used to having conversations with people about Sabbath or Sunday, right, which day is the real Sabbath, for us sometimes the Sabbath can become the which day question and we lose sight of what the Sabbath actually means and is meant to mean to us. It's, it's the Sabbath question is not about what day you go to church. You can go to church every day of the week. I don't care. Right? Worship God every day of the week. This is not about what day you go to church. This is, this is much deeper than that. And that's what we're going to be exploring. So for Adventists, I want to take them beneath that that, that question, which is the way that many of them interact with it. We have so many books and stuff written over which day, blah, blah, blah. We've got to go deeper than that. We've got to go deeper than that. And so that's what we're going to do for Adventists. If, if you're not an Adventist and you're like, why do Adventists talk so much about this Sabbath thing? Why is it such a big deal to them? Well, hopefully this series will help answer that question as well. Um, because we do focus on this commandment an awful lot. And, and and it's not because it's the most important commandment or it's not the most important thing we found, find in the Bible. It's because it's something we feel that most Christians have left behind and, and we want to rescue the Sabbath of, and, and see it being practiced by, by everybody because we think it's a really cool thing, all right? So that's, that's, that's our motivation. Uh, we don't kill people. We don't commit adultery. We try to honor our mom and dad and we keep Sabbath. Like, we're trying, to, we're trying to be good with all ten. So that's why Adventists emphasize the fourth, because it seems to be the one that is a little bit controversial with folks. And, uh, yeah, so that's where we are. And, and together, I hope, in the end, we realize that we come to appreciate the Sabbath for what it is, which is the very first gift given to human beings. Oh, yeah, Adam and Eve. Went to sleep, day, well, Adam went to sleep day six. Uh, you know, wakes up, there's Eve. That's a good nap. That's why men still take naps. Uh, you're just hoping to find out there's a rib gone and the woman of your dreams is there. If you're already married, then, you know, you sort that out. But uh, that's, that's how it works, right? They woke up and together, the first full day they spent together was Sabbath. 
first day they spent together was Sabbath. I like to think in the morning of the sixth day, God created the animals, the land animals, and then on the afternoon of the sixth day, God created Adam and had him name some animals, and then toward evening, he's like, hey, here's Eve. Toward the evening of the day, and then, boom, day's over. They wake up. New day, it's Sabbath, right? So Sabbath, in that sense, is the first gift given to human beings. It's the first day that Adam and Eve had to share together, where every, everything in creation had its pair, had its mate, had its match. And so the whole created world was one, it was in harmony on that very first Sabbath, all right? But I don't want to begin there. I want to begin right here at the bottom of your screen in Genesis 1, verse 20. It says, so the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky, and all the wild animals, but for Adam, no suitable helper was found. Now, that last line is a bit of, uh, a, bit of a, a theological jungle for some folks trying to sort out what does that mean, no suitable helper was found. What, what exactly is Eve to Adam, right? Uh, we're not going to get into all that, whoo, um, but I, I bring this up because I think this is the first clue to the uniqueness of the Sabbath day among everything else that happened in that creation week. This is, this is a clue. Because the story of creation is a story of pairing. Everything finding its, its, its corresponding member of the pair. All right? Um, we were talking about the animal, right? Every animal has its mate. Uh, even the days of creation, let me show you here on the screen, have their pairs. We see this, this, um, f this form and filling happening during creation week. So in, in day one, as you see there, God separates the light from the darkness. But in day four, he fills that out with the sun, moon, and stars. In day two, he separates the, the waters below from the waters above, which means the sky and the sea. He separates them on day two. But in day five, he creates air and sea creatures. And of course, in day three, he creates land, plants, and trees. And then in day six, he creates land, animals, and humans, right? So you see in that left column there, days one, two, and three, God is kind of, he's establishing the rough form of the day, you know, just kind of separating light from darkness in general, separating sky from sea in general. It's not super specific about what that means. So he forms it in that left column, and then he fills it in that right column. And so day one has its pair in day four, and day two with day five, and day three with day six. They all have their pairs. Even the days have their pairs. So the, the animals have their pairs. The days have their pairs. And of course, Adam eventually gets his pair. And of course, you read this account and you realize the only thing without a pair, without something corresponding to it, that is its match or its mate, is the Sabbath day. There's seven days. Days one through six, they all have their pair together. Day seven stands alone. Even Adam, he's created without a pair. He's created without his corresponding other half, but he finds her. The animals have their other halves. The only thing that's left dangling, the only thing that's just, that's left unfilled, that's been formed but unfilled, is the seventh day. And that's curious, isn't it? Why is the Sabbath left alone? Now, we all know God could have created it in one day, could have created it in a hundred days, could have chosen as much time as He wanted to, to, to make this process work. So we have to believe that the seven days of that week were intentionally chosen to make a point, to teach us something. And there's the seventh day just hanging there, standing alone. Well, it says here in chapter 2 that, uh, that when God finished all this, He rested and blessed the seventh day and made it holy. In fact, it's the only thing made holy in all of creation, not human beings. Human beings were, in fact, created in the image of God. That's cool. But only the Sabbath was made holy. Now, holiness, as you read throughout the Bible, is an attribute that belongs to God alone. You don't find a story of King David going out in the wilderness and finding a holy deer. He probably did find a holy cow, though. Yeah, holy cow. 
I did find it. That's why that expression is with us, okay? That's the one exception to this, right? But holiness is an attribute of, of God. It's a divine attribute. So whatever is holy, if you find something in the world that's holy, it means that God's presence has been there. All right? You remember Moses? He finds that burning bush. What does God tell him to do? Take off your shoes, and then God smelled Moses' feet and said, put them back on, please. Just kidding. He said, take off your shoes because the ground you're standing on is holy. Is it because that Moses had wandered into some patch of sand or rock that was intrinsically holy? No, it's because the presence of God was there. And presumably, after the presence of God departed, you know, walk all up and down that mountain, you're, you, you're probably not going to be asked to take your shoes off anymore. It's, it's a quality of God's presence. So when the day, why was the, the temple holy? Because God's presence was, was in the most holy place. But then even right next to that, a little curtain separating that compartment from the other, is the holy place. Why? Because God's presence is in this place. And so there are certain things you have to know if you want to enter God's presence. So when the Sabbath is declared holy, one can't help but conclude that it is made that way because the presence of God resides within those hours. Does that make sense? We're not talking about mere fruits of the Spirit, which of course are, are, are fruits of the Spirit's influence in your life. But even if, you know, you don't care about God, you can still be patient to a degree and, and loving and all these things to a degree. I still think they're, they're a result of the Spirit being in our world, but, but you can never be holy apart from God, not even a little bit. It is an attribute that belongs to God, and He gives that attribute, He gives that characteristic to whomever or whatever He chooses. So when you see something in the Bible that's holy, that's a really big deal because that means the presence of God has been there. It's like you, you, you know somebody's scent, like the, some perfume or cologne that they use, and it's like if you smell it in your car, you know that they have been there in your car, right? Like you, you, even if they're not there right now, it's like, oh, that, I know that scent. I associate that with this person. So when you see holiness in the Bible, you associate that with God. And so to be, to be holy simply means to be set apart. It says in some translations that God sanctified the, the seventh day, which means to set it apart for some holy purpose. Like it has been chosen, it has been called for some purpose of God. And God has great purposes for the seventh day. We're going to look at a few of those today. Purpose number one, the Sabbath reminds us that life is not all about us. Well, <laughs> I mean, that's something we know. I mean, I know that. I mean, I, I you know, I, I know that up here. Um, but if you're Adam and Eve, waking up for the first time to new life, the Sabbath reminds you that, that life is not all about you, that this story is not all about human beings. Well, hmm, that's challenging. That's challenging because how do you know that if you're Adam and Eve? Because you realize that the day you were created is not the end of the creation story. You're towards the end, but it, it doesn't end with day six and God's done. And that would imply then that the creation of human beings was the, was the peak, the pinnacle of God's creative purpose. No, it's not. It goes on past you if you're Adam and Eve, into the seventh day. And it's not your day that was made holy. It's the seventh day that was made holy. So if you're Adam and Eve waking up into this new world, you think, okay, this, this story of creation week is not all about us. We're not, the, we're not the top of this food chain here that God is constructing. It's actually the Sabbath is after us, and it's the Sabbath that is, that is blessed and made holy, not us. So, so there's something even after us. Okay, I'm not at the end of the week. I'm not on the last page of this story. I'm toward the end. I'm important, but I'm not, I'm not the point of this creation story. That's good to keep in mind. You know, I mean, our, our, our theological panoramic view as Christians is usually... Um, very self-focused. God created me. God has a great purpose for me. God came down in the flesh and redeemed me and died for me and rose for me. And then sometime in the future, God's going to come get me. And it's always God doing stuff for me. I'm always the object of everything. I'm always the, 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 the main focus in the way that I narrate that theological story where it's just all about me. 
in everything that God does for me. I mean, sure, I appreciate God. He's amazing. He did all these things for me, 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 me. And we've got to be careful in how we tell that story because the story of God is not the story of me. God existed before me, and God will exist after me, and God exists far above me, right? And we got to, in, the, in this creation week, helps us to keep that in mind. It helps us to keep that in mind. Karl Barth, the, the great theologian, uh, once wrote that the Sabbath was man's first day, but it was God's seventh now, of course, God is much older than that, but, but, but it was to drive home that point to Adam and Eve. This is your first day here. I've been here a lot longer than you. Just keep that in mind. It's not all about you. You're not the star of this show. I've, I've been doing this a little bit longer than you have. You're the newbie. You're the baby human here, all right? It's not about you. All right. It's good to keep in mind. It's good to keep in mind, all right? The Sabbath reminds us that we are not the main character in this story. Uh, likewise, the story that Jesus told of the Good Samaritan, the hero of that story, is not the man who was hurt in the side of the road. Our story of redemption, the hero is the, is the Good Samaritan who stopped and helped him. That would be Jesus. The hero is not the one who needed help. In fact, we don't know his name. We hardly know anything about that person. And, and I think that parable helps us understand what Creation Week is trying to teach us, that we're not the, we're not the focus of everything that's going on in the story that we're telling. It's God who's the focus and what God is doing. So we're in awe of God's creation and we're in awe of God's incarnation and we're in awe of God's sacrifice on the cross and God's resurrection and God's return in the sky. Like we're in awe of that. And it's not about me, 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 me. Okay, purpose number two. We're still important. <laughs> It's a good thing to keep this in mind, guys, because there's only, there's only two days during this week that are given the definite article in Hebrew, because even though we put, the, we put it in there in English, you know, in the evening and the morning was the first day and second day. In, in Hebrew, it's just um, an evening and morning were first day, were second day, were third day. Only two days get the definite article, which is the sixth day and the seventh day are the only ones that are given that kind of emphasis, that little extra oomph to remind us that these are important days. So we're still important. And the, and the order of creation throughout this week reminds us that we are not mere animals as human beings. There's, there's some kind of differentiation between me and that holy cow. We share a day. We're all created. We all have the breath of God, all that kind of stuff. But, but there's a difference between us. It wasn't the cow that was asked to come name Adam. It was Adam who was asked to come, come name the cow. And the cow had its mate to begin with. Adam had to discover his. There's, the, the way that God interacts with the humans is different than the way that God interacts with the animals because it was only the humans that were created in his image. So the story is not all about us, but we are important to God's story. We are important because we were created in, in his image. Um, if the seventh day was the first full day that these baby humans had to enjoy, then, then God ceasing from his work was like mom calling in sick so she can spend the day with them. Like when it says that God finished his work, he's like, man, they're here. They're here, and I'm, I'm just, I'm not going to work anymore. I'm done. I quit. I'm going to go down there and spend the day with them. And I, I think that's really important because oftentimes when we talk about what Genesis means here when it says that, uh, that uh, on the seventh day God had finished the work he had been doing, so on the seventh day he rested from his work. We often just kind of take that as a standalone statement, but the question really is, he rested to do what? He finished his work to do what? Right? God isn't just getting off work here. He isn't just clocking out. He's leaving early. He's leaving to go do something. There's a reason why he finished his work. There's a reason why he rested. And, and that reason is you and I. That reason is us. That he wanted to spend time with us. So he stopped doing everything else that he had been doing after we were created. And he said, now I want a day with them. He didn't do that after the first day. He didn't do that after the third day, after the fourth day. He did that after the sixth day, after we had been created. That's when God said, I'm done. I'm going to go spend some time with them now. 
And you think, man, okay, we, we, it's kind of a cliche here that everybody's busy in this world. Everybody's busy. In fact, if I ask you how are things going and you don't say busy, I mean, have you ever had anybody be like, I have a ton of free time? Like, just, I don't even know what to do. I am so not busy. I just, you know, I just sit around and stare at the ceiling fan and, and see if I can count how many times it goes around, you know? I mean, we would look down on those people like, don't you know the correct answer is I'm busy? Even if you're not busy, you say you're busy because it's a virtue to be busy, apparently. It means you're important if you're busy. So, if anybody had a legitimate reason to say I'm busy, it would be God. Like, don't you have another planet to go to? Don't you have uh, a Gabriel to go play golf with on some cloud somewhere? Like, if anybody had something else to go do that was actually really important, it would be God. But God takes the day off to spend it with us. Of all the things that he could conceivably be doing, and the, and the things that he could conceivably be doing are infinite in number, he took the day off to be with us. Man, I mean, have you ever met somebody who is, you know, maybe the a head of a company or just is managing a lot, they have a lot on their plate, and, and they take time off to be with you? I mean, it, it's, it, 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 it feels so, it's such an honor, right? Because you realize they've got other things to do. Who am I in, their, in the scheme of their life? But to, but to voluntarily take time off and invest it in you, it, it means so much. And, and the same thing on an infinite scale with God. He's like, I want to take time off with you. Uh, you're not the subject of this story, but you are really important to me. You're created in the image of God. I'm going to create, take a day off and, 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 and spend it with you. Now, back to Karl Barth. He says very famously here, he said, the reason why that he, meaning God, refrains from further activity on the seventh day is that he has found the object of his what? Of his love and has no need of any further works. Isn't that something? I can't say it any better than that. God has found, finally, in the creation of human beings, the object of his love and has no need for any further works. Mm. Well, it's because God loves us from the very moment of our creation that, that I think we are tempted to think this story is really about us. Because when God loves us, he shines the spotlight on us. You know, just like when you love your kids or your grandkids, you like, you throw them up and you lavish attention on them and you're like, let's go make cookies, let's go outside and play in the sprinkler, let's go do this. Like, you make that day all about them. That's just what you naturally do because you love them, right? You, you're, you're shining the spotlight on them. And, and we, immature children that we all are, can tend to get, let that get to our heads and be like, I really am amazing. This really is all about me. And, and, and maybe not realize that it's God's love that shines that spotlight on us, that puts us on center stage, that, that, that claps at every terrible joke we tell and laughs at it, you know, and, and encourages us on and all those sort of things. Like it's God's love that does that. Let's not let that get to our head, that it's really about us, that I'm such an amazing person that has merited God's love and this attention from the creator of the universe. Um, it's not. It's not. It's because he delights in you and he has found in you uh, something that he just finds so remarkable and amazing. I don't know what it is about you, but he has and he loves you and he shines that spotlight on you. Um, it's not because you are the center of the universe, but, it is, but he's the center of the universe and he's shining that, he's sharing that spotlight with you because he loves you. And that's cool. And that's cool. Man, I mean, it's just, you know, he does this in the same way that people on social media change all of their pictures to baby pictures when, when they have a grandkid or a kid or something. Okay, I'm not trying to call anybody out here. You know who you are. I mean, have you ever had that moment where somebody adds you on Facebook or something? You don't know, you don't remember exactly who they are by their name, so you click on their profile picture, and it's baby. And you, okay, well, maybe I'll recognize them if I can see a picture of them. Next one, baby. Next one, baby. Next one, baby. And it's like, I don't know who this person is. I, they're just, apparently, somebody put an 18-month-year-old on Facebook and gave them a profile. I, I, I don't know how else to explain it. But that's kind of what God does, right? He just, he puts us as his profile picture because he's proud of us. It doesn't mean that we are now God, all right? So the Sabbath was God's way of saying, there's, there's nowhere else in the universe I would rather be than with you. I'm, I don't want to go to work and miss a second of this. 
Man, that makes Sabbath really special for us. It really is. It really is. Let's get on to purpose number three. We are worth more than our work. This is what Sabbath reminds us of. We are worth more than our work. Okay. Well, God tells the first human beings, go out, conquer the earth, subdue it, da-da-da-da-da. All right, I want you to organize this place. I want you to learn how to breed sheep and breed llamas and plant gardens and tame, you know, tame this thing. Uh, in a, in a, not in the, you know, I'm going to murder, every, murder everybody kind of way and conquering lands. Not in the way that it eventually became, but just in a way of like bring order to this place. This is what we do when we buy a house or we decide to go out into the yard, right? It's like we see this sea of grass and weeds and so okay we call somebody spray the weeds fertilize this place we go and we rent something and we dig up a patch of it and we put rocks around it and we put mulch in there and we put flowers like what are we doing we're, we're, we're doing what God originally told us to do of bringing order to a place and, and it's a very creative process because the way I may landscape something is different than the way you may landscape something. There's no like, right way to do it. It's all according to how we see these things personally and what our tastes are. But we're bringing order to this, and you can't stop yourself. Now, I know I said I don't tell stories about my family. <laughs> Laura is saying why. I don't know how she knows this is about her. Laura, I'm going to let you. I, I know, I know. I'm treading very carefully here. Very frequently, rooms in our house will be rearranged. If, if you have visited our house like two times in like two months, it could be different both times. Because we're all, uh, there's some, this is a moment for testimonies here, but we're going to not do that, all right? Because I know there's some conviction going on around here right now. But you know who you are, but this is that instinct to constantly rearrange and tinker and let's move this over a little bit and do this. And like, we've got to organize our world. We've got to subdue the earth. That, uh, we're just following what God originally told us to do. That's what we do. That's our work. That's our work. That is our original calling to work. And and all week long, with our career and, and even working around our house, all week long, the, especially when it comes to our career, the calculus that we make is that my time is worth so much of your money. And I need food, and I need another plant pot. And I need other things. I need couches and TVs and other things, right? So, so I'm going to trade my time for your money so that I can get those things. All right? Now, back in the day, they didn't have money. You just trade your time for those things uh, directly. And Sabbath reminds us of the importance of time itself. Because you only get 24 of these hours. And God is completely uninterested in putting a dollar amount on your time on Sabbath. And he wants you to not put a dollar amount on your time on Sabbath too. Because it re all week long, from Sunday to Friday, we're making this calculus, okay? You may not go to work on Sunday, but you may go to Lowe's on Sunday. And, and you have in your pocket a card which represents a bank of your time and how much it was worth recently. And so you go and you make that exchange. And, and God is like, on Sabbath, it's not about how much your time is worth. On Sabbath, your time is priceless. You are more than your work in the dollar amount that is associated with that. You don't have to work yourself seven days a week all the time and, and become this machine, this human machine. You are worth more than that. Time matters because what you find out, right, is when you're just, when you're just at work in one form or another seven days a week, the time just slips by faster and faster and faster and faster. There's no real rhythm to life. Every day is essentially the same as the one before it. And you're either working to generate money or you're spending it or you're installing or applying the things that you spend it on. Like just if it's this nonstop cycle seven days a week of living that way, well, basically you're just living to produce and consume. And you're just part of this kind of cycle, this animalistic cycle. Right? I need to eat and then I need to go hunt again and eat again and hunt again. And that's all you are, right? Like that's, that's the cycle that you've placed yourself into. Sabbath reminds us 
that it's okay to not have to go out and be a consumer or a producer, either working or shopping. Just go and be yourself, that your time matters, that it's good to slow down a little bit and just spend time with the people that matter the most in your life and the things that God has given you and just to be content with what you have. Amen. Sabbath is not a day to go improve my lot in the universe. It's a day to enjoy what I have. I want you to keep in mind, we're, we're three into these, we're three, pur three of these purposes into this. This is, this is what Sabbath would have taught Adam and Eve. Work is important, but it's not everything you are. You've got to learn how to stop at some point because it, it can be a cycle that just sucks you in and it will never let you out. There's never an easy time to say no. You know, because there's always like, oh man, one more job, one more gig, I could take one more rider, you know, and just make that little extra money and more and more and more. There's no clear boundary with that. Sabbath, God's like, sun's going down, you go down. <laughs> Stop. And he does it for our own good, not to, not to constrain us, not to hold us back, but for our own good, he knows that we need to have boundaries because we'll work ourselves down. So God's like, that's what Sabbath is for, okay? It's, it's to remind you that we are worth more than our work. This is not a day where you barter your time for a treasure. This is a day where you enjoy your time and don't be so quick to give it away. All right, purpose number four, there is more than just today. This is what Sabbath tells us. There is more than just today. Heschel uh, wrote a beautiful book on the Sabbath. It's called The Sabbath. I think 1951 it was published. He says, unless one learns how to relish the taste of Sabbath, one will be unable to enjoy the taste of eternity in the world to come. And what this suggests to us, of course, is that Sabbath, the day we're celebrating right now, is meant to be a reminder of the life to come. So not only is Sabbath a break in time in our work week, but Sabbath is also a break in our mentality because you know, because we're busy, 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 busy all the time, I mean, I have a hard time conceiving of what I have to do three weeks from now because I have a hard time seeing past Monday. Like, I just see all the things that I do within the next week. I can't think of what's going on three weeks, and so sometimes people come up to me and they're like, hey, what do you think about August 21st? We go do this, and I'm like, sure. I don't know. I don't know what day that is. I don't know. I can't even think that far ahead, right? Because there's just so much going on. And so we can end up living these nearsighted lives where it's kind of like driving, but you're just looking like two feet in front of the hood. That's not the safest way to drive. I hate to break it to you. It's not the safest way to live either. I understand that sometimes we've got to do that. We're so busy, right? But Sabbath is a day where God is inviting us to look up and just enjoy the view. Because if you're just staring at the road in front of you, you're missing the mountains on this side and the fields on this side and the sunset in front of you. You're just, you're just trying to, all you can see is just a little bit in front of you and it's not an enjoyable way to live. And it's not a safe way to drive through life. And on Sabbath, God is like, it's not always going to be like this. Sabbath is a foretaste of the life that God has planned for all of us in a new heavens and a new earth. It is. And the reason why I say that is because Sabbath was designed, was designed for a perfect world. Sabbath is not the result of the fall. Sabbath is a result of creation. Presumably, if Adam and Eve had never sinned, we would all be in a perfect world right now, keeping Sabbath right now. It was designed for this perfect world. And so when we fell, it remains as this slice of the perfect world which we lost. And so it remains to remind us of the perfect world which is to come. All right? It's the one day of the week where you can tell your boss to go fly a kite. You can, you can ignore bill collector, let them go straight to voicemail. You can keep the homework in the backpack, right? It is a foretaste of a new day where you don't have to worry about any of those things, all right? Now, if I'm your boss, please don't tell me to fly a kite. <laughs>
All right, I'm no one's boss. All right, let's go on to purpose number five. Let's get moving here. Sabbath is filled with presence, with the presence of God. I mean, this whole, we, we mentioned this, so I'll go through this quickly. Um, you know, but the whole temple tradition is about this is, we're going to create a space for God to live in, not just Jewish or Christian temple ideas, but also pagan temple, like we create temples for the gods to live in. And this is their sacred space. But Sabbath, long before any temple, reminds us that there is such a thing as sacred time and not just space. And sacred time is before sacred space. Sacred time also contains the presence of God. Not just some temple somewhere that you travel to once a year because it's so far away. Not just a place you make a pilgrimage to that's thousands of miles away. It's sacred time. Everybody has time. Not everybody lives in the same space. And so for the ancient people, especially for the ancient Jews and early Christians, you may not be able to get to the temple. You may not be able to get to worship God that way, very often at least, and, and be near the presence of God. But you all had Sabbath, and the presence of God comes near you. All right? And that's special. That's special. Purpose number six, God, Sabbath shows us God's desire for love. God wasn't content with koala bears. I know, they're cute. But God didn't stop after the koala bears. He stopped after human beings were created. He wanted people in his own image, people who could love him as he loved them. So God doesn't just lay eggs and move on to a different planet. He creates people in his own image, and then he creates a day to share with them. He wants a relationship with us. He didn't just stay up in the sky and do his thing. He came down. He came down and talked with Adam, and talked with Eve, and wanted to get to know them. And that's what Sabbath was supposed to be about. I don't know how it was all supposed to function if we had never fallen. Maybe God does his thing during the week, and then on Sabbath he comes back to earth and spends some time with us. I don't know how it was meant to be uh, week in and week out. But it was probably something like that, at least. It was probably something like that. He wants to be known by us and loved by us. And the seventh and final one, you had to have seven when we're talking about Sabbath, right? could have gone on for hours about this and, and talk about all these great purposes in the design of the Sabbath. Uh, but Sabbath reminds us of who deserves our worship. Adam and Eve were in no danger of worshiping a golden calf so long as they kept Sabbath because it reminds them that the calf was this morning, we're now, Sabbath is a day that we spend with God. Why would we think a calf did this for us? Why would we think a golden snake or a, some other carved God did this for us? When we have Sabbath together and we're, and we're finding God on this day, it is a weekly reminder of who our Creator is. And so we're not in any danger of idolatry or, or losing focus here on what really matters so long as we have Sabbath. It reminds us of who deserves our worship, which is what we'll get to when we get to the Sabbath in, in, in Revelation as well. Because the Sabbath doesn't rest on the cycle of the moon or on the cycle of the sun like our months and years do. Sabbath rests purely on God's whim to create the world in seven days. It's the only reason for it. It's the only reason for the seven-day week is because that's how God did it in Genesis. And so when we keep Sabbath, we're, we're acknowledging God's creative authority. And we're saying, well, you know, we're not following some star in doing this. We're following Him. It's the only reason for it. So you keep Sabbath, you worship the true God. It doesn't mean everybody who keeps Sabbath is, is necessarily always worshiping the true God, but as long as you're keeping Sabbath well, you will never forget who your Creator is. Never forget it. Now, I want to close with this. I said earlier that the Sabbath is the only part of creation that stands alone, that is left without a mate, without a pair. And that is true to an extent, but it's also not true. And that is, when you see this here, and we're going to talk about this more next week, so that God ended His work which He had done, and He rested on the seventh day from all His work which He had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it He rested from all His work which God had created and made. Um, I want to draw your attention to this. Okay, we're going to just map out that verse a little bit. It says that God finished the work, so on the seventh day He rested. These are things that He did on the Sabbath, these two verbs. The other two verbs, again, we're going to unpack this all next week, are things he did to the Sabbath. So on the Sabbath, he finished the work and rested. 
then he turns to the Sabbath and he blesses it and makes it holy. And this is something similar to the pattern we saw during the entire creation week where he, he kind of, there's the form and the fill, right? Here there's the on and there's the to. On the day he does these first two things, to the day he does these other two things, which I think gives us this delightful little hint that God himself is the pair that the, the other side of the pair that the Sabbath has been missing. He forms the seventh day, and then he fills it by blessing it and making it holy. He forms the seventh day, and then he fills it with his presence. God himself is the, is the missing piece that completes the symmetry of creation. Adam found his Eve. The animals all found their other animals. The days all were paired off with each other. Sabbath was alone until God filled it with himself. That's why Adventists talk about the Sabbath a lot. That's why we do. Last word from Abraham Heschel. He says, Sabbath is a day of harmony and peace. Peace between man and man. Peace within man. And I love that too. It's a day for us to find peace within ourselves. And, and, and some of the, the wrestling with self-doubt or the, the frustration with our lack of progress in life and these kind of things. And we, sometimes you're at just at war with yourself. Sabbath is a day to make peace with yourself too. Uh, and peace with all things. Peace with all things. All that is divine, that is all that's been touched by God in this world, is brought into union with God on the Sabbath. This is Sabbath and the true happiness of the universe. Isn't that beautiful? Sabbath was a day that all creation comes together. It is not a day for hunting. It's a day for harmony. It's a day for everything being united with God. I, I think we just caught a little glimpse there of the original vision of what the Sabbath was supposed to be about. And we lost some of that when we fell, when we introduced sin into the world. But we still get glimpses of that. We now know what to aim for when we celebrate on Sabbath. As you can see, Sabbath is not just a day of like, well, it's not Sunday, so we're right. It's not a day to just go home and sleep the whole day. It's not a day to, to go about to treat it like a Friday or treat it like a Sunday. It's a special day. And I think when we understand what God's goals were, what he was trying to teach us through the Sabbath, it, it helps us figure out how better to celebrate Sabbath. This is a day to celebrate not a day to weep. This is a day to be in harmony with all of God's creation, not to be at odds with it. All right? So, you know, if I see a deer, you may have to hunt the deer the other day of the week, you know, and control the population. But on this day, I choose not to because God created that deer and, and I want to be in harmony with it and, uh, and, and be its brother creation. And, you, you know, you get this idea of, you realize that this day is not about, uh, this is a day to read spiritual books. This is a day to be in the presence of God. And if spiritual books help you get there, great. But we can find ways to secularize this day even while we celebrate it. And we just make it a list of things we should do and things we shouldn't do. And that's not what the Sabbath is all about. Sabbath is so much more than that. It was designed to be so much more than that. And I don't know how we can not be in awe of what God intended the Sabbath to be in our world. I don't know how that can't strike us. And it, 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 it grieves me sometimes because we see people who are so quick to get rid of it. Like the, the first hint of a text in the Bible, like, yep, see, Sabbath's gone. Whew! And you're like, oh, okay, 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 okay. But if you really understood the Sabbath, like, would we be so instinctively ready to just dismiss it the first chance. You know what I mean? Like, why is it not, um, oh, this text seems to suggest the Sabbath is gone. Darn! You know, like, I, I'm going to miss it. I, I love what God was trying to do. You know, what I mean? like, why don't we see that attitude when we really understand what the Sabbath was trying to do and to be and to remind you that you're more than your work, to remind you that you're important in the eyes of God, that this story is really about God and not about you. When, it re when, when you realize the Sabbath was meant to teach us all of those things, and, you, you know, like, why, why are we so eager to see it being gotten rid of? 
So I, I think that's worth thinking about, if that's you, if that's kind of your instinct to the Sabbath. And I think if you already celebrate Sabbath and appreciate it, this is a good time to, to say, what do I do on Sabbath? And, and how can I be more intentional about making this about Him more than me? All right, I mean, when I came in Adventist, my, uh, you know, we went to church and we got home and then folks slept until about five or four. And I was just by myself in the house playing Legos. <laughs> and then, you know, you go park in the, in the parking lot until the sun goes down, keep an eye on the clock, and then, you know, you can go in. And I had a few Sabbaths like that. And you realize that's not how Sabbath is meant to be spent. <laughs> Waiting for the sun to go down in the parking lot, you know. That's not the, that's not the purpose here. That's not the goal. I can, I can do a little bit better than that. And so I think it's a good challenge for us to recapture the real meaning of Sabbath together. All right, we're going to keep talking about it. We'll keep brainstorming. And uh, just leave your heart open to how God may be speaking to you uh, on your Sabbath keeping, and maybe you're ready to keep Sabbath for the first time, great. Um, but if you've been, even if you've been keeping it for a long time, how does, how does God want me to treat this day? What is God trying to say to me and to my life through this day? Because even I can enter into its hours even with a head full of busyness. So how do I empty myself for the rest of the week and just be, be open for God's presence today? Let's pray. Father, I just want to... I want to thank you for the Sabbath. Truly, Lord, <laughs> we, have, uh, we have so far to go in terms of appreciating your plans for us, appreciating the, 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 your design in the beginning and what you were trying to say to us, what you were trying to teach us. Everything that you did, Lord, was, is instructive which is why David said that he meditates on the law day and night because he recognized, Lord, that everything you did, everything you spoke to us, everything you had somebody write down is meant to teach us something about how to get back to that original way that you intended for us to live. And we want to get back there, Lord. We're, we don't want to live in this kind of, with this emptiness, with this shallowness, this racing through life without really looking around without really appreciating or giving thanks and treating life as a gift. I mean, this is the way so many people live. We don't want to live that way. We want to get back to that, that fullness of life that you had planned for us from the beginning. And Sabbath was a big part of that, Lord. We see it. Well, help us to, to treat Sabbath better and through it to treat you better, realizing that your presence has filled these hours. These are not our hours to spend, Lord. There are, these hours are a gift from you. We appreciate them. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.